Greetings once again. Here we are at House to House DI or House to House Discipleship Institute in sunny Wildemar, California. It was a nice, cool uh, 98 degrees today. We were just wonderfully uh, enjoying the heat. I mean, you could be honest and say, no, we didn't enjoy it. But to be honest, we enjoy it because we know there's good things that come out of the heat. You know, he's he's an all purging fire. I mean, all consuming fire according to Hebrew. So might as well go ahead and enjoy it. But I want to uh, welcome all the viewers, all the listeners. Uh, tell a friend, uh, write, call, tap them, wake them up. Uh, just things that we're sharing. Remember, we've been starting with the uh, the whole father-son approach to scripture. How uh, if you and I would do it scripturally, follow the pattern, the form, and the fashion. The pattern, the form, and the fashion. The results will be what the father said he would be. Uh, results would be and entail the way he spoke to Abraham. So you go back to Abraham because he cut covenant with Abraham and said, Abraham, I know I can trust you because you will connect your children. You will begin to order their lives according to the scripture. So that's what the father's looking for. Are we willing to go back to the pattern? I know it's hard because especially when we have our own views of what the vision is, but the father had a vision. The original order of father and son, listen to this, father-son order is a principle established by Yahuwah uh, and was the governmental order for ministry in the tabernacle and temple. Mm. Tabernacle meaning Moses's and then temple meaning Solomon's. But what's really a trip, if you study it in the new covenant, he said, know ye not that you are the temple that's it you got you guys read your bible i'm so proud of you because when you when you read your bible the bible becomes the greatest commentary of all commentaries because you just go back to the word okay so let's read on he says no one had a right to ministry no one had a right to ministry and we got everybody calling each other bishops apostles and uh, doctors and let's see uh, lawyers or or pastors uh, evangelists uh, we got female bishops, we got homosexual uh, apostles and bishops, so we got a mess. And then the ones that truly have a true apostolic call and they're uh, bringing forth reformation and they're really uh, applying the father-son revelation to become a lifestyle, they're being hammered, they're being crushed, they're being spoken about, they're being lied about, they're, being, they're just... There, it, the scripture says no weapon formed against me, but my goodness, we feel like every weapon and every army is against us. But we have the victory because that's what the word says. So let me finish that paragraph. No one had the right to ministry unless he was of the tribe of Levi and to be a priest, he had to be a son of Aaron. The church should be the representative of the kingdom order and not a worldly system. We, you know we got a worldly system. Hallelujah. How is the father-son order lost in the church? Instead of using gov God, instead of using Yahuwah's government order for ministry in the church, many model their order after modern practices of business by hiring pastors and leaders to work in their organization. It is a worldly system unless the order of ministry is from father to son. You're just hiring hirelings. You know, they just worried about the money and the shade. They're not worried about you. They don't want a relationship with the leadership, the set man. In Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, don't turn there, but that's, write it down. That's one of the verses that the Father uses himself when he said, I set in the ecclesia, in the kingdom, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, and then he enumerates, goes on, he, administrations, workings of miracles, and healings, this, that, and the other. But there had to be a total degression, like we came to base zero. That's where we've been. He's been defining us. He's been confining us. Oh, my goodness. If you haven't felt in confinement where you can't even move or you can't even lay, raise your hands to worship, I mean, it's a battle. But once you break through, it's a lifestyle. Okay, uh, so that's why the Father-Son order is lost in the church because we don't follow 
biblical scriptural order. Okay, the next one, what is the judgment for for not following the biblical order, Father and Son? What is the judgment? You asked. The judgment of Yah's uh, people who refuses government order for ministry is a lack of order and a loss of truth. These, this generates immaturity and confusion because they lose their identity and purpose to the Father. See, they think they're connecting to a man, but when the man resists them or tells them, no, not yet, at the appointed time, you'll, you'll, you'll be, at the appointed time, you'll come forth. Well, then they leave and then they talk about the leadership that they swore up and down when they came to the church building that they were going to stay for the whole duration. And we have that repeating itself today. We have it in many uh, uh, what I call, you know, religious settings. But if you're in the kingdom and you're really teaching kingdom, I'm telling you, you're going to clean house. But those that are really, really called will come back and begin to see the fruit of it. Amen? Amen. Okay, uh, the last uh, point that I wanted to show you there was how did the Apostle Paul show the Corinthian church the way out of this dilemma? Now remember, Paul was a father. So Paul, as a father, is writing to the Corinthians and he's, he's, got in a, he's walking in a dilemma, in a problem. Paul reminds them that there is an order to apostolic ministry of father to son by reminding them that as he follows Mashiach, they should come in alignment also. Since he is their father, both in the gospel and in the ministry, he sends his son Timothy as an example of a true son in proper ministerial order to remind them of his ways in Mashiach. Mm -hmm. So father's son has a reflection of the kingdom and the church. Father's son has a reflection of the kingdom and the church, okay? Remember, he told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Okay, so there's gates. Not just one gate, but there's many. There's actually 12 gates. So you need to know these things so we can go on and bring, uh, bring you some insight, a little bit of the insight to the things that I was speaking about. Let me read you uh, here is... How do we know that Abraham's faith made the promise generational? Remember everything, remember everything you and I are doing and saying is attributed to the Father and the covenant he made with the Son. See, Father, Son. Spiritually speaking, Father, Son. Why was he said in the scripture? He said he was not ashamed to bring many sons. Many. He was not. Why? Because he knew that. To, have, to produce a son after his image and likeness and then produce more sons in the image and likeness enables us to recover the generational blessing that was spoken over Abraham in the beginning. Matter of fact, I believe it was Genesis chapter 12, Bereshit 12. And the reason I'm saying that is because the father looked at us as covenantal when he began to give the promise of, to a generational movement. Listen to me closely. Mm. Let, me, let me read this. I got to read this part because I was reading through it. Okay? Yeshua never responds to your need. He's generational. Yeshua responds to, to you at the moment you release your seed. Now listen to me. Your seed. Abraham tied to Melchizedek and in his tithing Levi was included. Levi wasn't even thought of yet. I'm letting you think because the father in his overall plan he always had you in mind, me in mind. Right now 20, we're in what, 21st century? Or yep. whatever they call it? 21st. 21st century family. Now watch, let me finish the, the thought here. Uh, he responds to uh, at the moment you release your seed, the seed in your hand is your harvest you keep now. The seed in your hand is your harvest you keep now. The seed you release now is the harvest Yahuwah releases for your future. The seed you release now is the harvest 
Yeshua releases for your future. Now, why is he saying that? Be now, watch. He's generational. When he's let's turn there real quick. Uh, oh, go for it. Uh, Genesis 12. You got to see this. You got to see it because it, it lines up to what I'm reading. Genesis 12. Let me grab my Bible. Go over there real quick. Hallelujah. That's a thought that I wrote down. In uh, 11, 21, 9. Okay, so that was uh, December 9th or December 21st, 09. Okay, Genesis 12. Let's read. Genesis 12, the father begins to speak to Abraham, who later on becomes Abraham. Hallelujah. And he says to them, Now, uh, I, verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will baruch thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a baruch. Okay? Verse 3. And I will baruch them that baruch thee or you and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be Barut, all families. So he invested and he's speaking a word to Abraham. Abraham is exercising his faith, receiving the rhema, the, <laughs> yeah, the rhema word from the lips, the pay of the father. Now, I don't know if he's seen an image. All I can do is read an image in my own mind. Imagine that the father was manifesting himself somehow to Abraham that got his intention and then Abraham says whatever it takes I'll go ahead and I'm willing to serve you whatever it takes whatever it takes I'm willing to serve you Baruch 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. how do we make our vision generational if we want to ensure that our vision becomes generational, then we must command our sons to carry on in the ministry and vision that Father has given us. Being able to command children carries with it the same directive given Timothy to commit to faithful men the things he had heard from his father Paul. There must be a passing on of the Father's ministry. Each generation... Ha! has a distinct mission, but it must expand on the foundation and purpose of the proceeding generation. I'll tell you, I know why I'm here. I know why I'm still alive at this age with all the stuff that I've gone through, my wife's gone through, we've both gone through with each other. And why? Because when I was a baby, a napios, and received the seed and the mission, it was a prophetic word to a generation that I would be living in. According to scripture, they say from 1 to 40 years or 1 to 50 years. I already passed both earmarks. Are you following me? That's why I can say I'm here in this generation. And I can see that the word that was placed in me was generational. Now watch closely. I'm not, and I'm going to define it and, and, and characterize it so you can follow it. When baby Jesus was born, his name by the angel that told the mother, hallelujah, you shall conceive a child and his name shall be called Emmanuel. What happened? Where did we change? The enemy was already working to keep Mary from having a generational, come on family, you got to hear me, a generational impact mm -hmm. to the name of her son that she was holding in her arms. Eight pounds of the future. Eight pounds that would grow to be more than six Ooh. feet tall. Ooh. New beginning with a new name. But yet, we denied that because the enemy came right away and said, the angel said his name shall be Emmanuel. I'm just raising my hands. I mean, then how did me and you get so sidetracked 
that we would take it from the Hebrew and still deny it and then come up with the beautiful name like Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ. The beautiful name like Jesus Christ. Well, I came to find out as the, as the, the older I got that, that we weren't uh, <laughs> we weren't really spawning a generational generation. Mm. We were spawning a pseudo Christianity that was driven by self-promotion, self-ambition, and self-motivation. Self-promotion, self-ambition, and self-motivation. Does that sound like the church you've been to? Yeah, that's why you went. You were so selfish, but you've seen all the Mercedes, Bentleys, and glass stain, and, and man, everybody had tuxes on, and they was just hot looking. The men were clean shaved, looking sharp, and you knew you had all your bling on, whether it was fake or not. You had it on, and you was ready to catch. And the men, same, same principle, they went in and, hey, they got some, hello, sister, how are you? My name is Doctor. You know, that's why you got your license from uh, the internet. Pay 30 bucks, and you're ordained. Okay, but here in the scripture, what I'm teaching you, the father speaks to Abraham and he says, look at that. When those that bless you, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless you to the point that in thee, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham departed as Yahuwah had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. See, they journeyed to go there, and they came into it. Why? Because Canaan is a spiritual dimension. Canaan is not a road map that you buy at the Jerusalem Hotel when you get to Israel. I know some of you planning a trip this year, but Canaan is still there. But there ain't no olive trees and there ain't, there's no angels there and there's no dance party. Because Canaan is a spiritual dimension that those of that have been born from above and have cut covenant with the Almighty, Yahuwah, He sees to it that you move into that dimension of, ha, more than enough. Because, you know, most of us talk about got more than enough, but we're still uh, cooking like we only got a little. We got to cook like we got more than enough. Amen? Let me go on. How are we able to restore the foundations of many generations? Ah, I'm glad you asked. We have the opportunity of restoring the foundations of many generations if we can bring the vision to the fourth generation. In the Bible, identity and purpose cannot be separated from his ancestry and offspring. We can fulfill the purpose of Mashiach by passing on the inheritance so sons in ministry can build other sons. Oh my goodness. Whew. Now listen, if we don't do that, then what happens? The church never matures. Because you can't mature a church. According to scripture, the church remains in the wilderness. I'm sorry, I know you keep saying, nah -uh, the church is the bride. Yes, but the bride is not the one that's so important. That's why the Catholics turned it over and said, thou art what? <laughs> to Mary. They made Mary greater than Mashiach. They made Mary greater than Jesus, if I can use that. Oh, hail, Mother of God, Mary! Yeah, that's what we're seeing today at Tifa. They're all getting paid by the Papa or the Popa. Unless you and I are willing to raise sons in this hour, we're going to miss His purpose. The curse of immaturity in the church world is due to a loss of excellence because they have not learned to think generationally. This immaturity has caused the church to live in single portions of Yahuwah's blessing and purpose rather in the double portion of inheritance. 
Come on, family. You know you go to the Pentecostal, Protestant, Kingdom, all of them. I mean, I got friends that still preach the double portion inheritance, double portion blessing, and they are not even fathering sons. And then to really make it even worse, they got a bunch of women surrounding them. Got to be careful, man, when lust comes around. Hallelujah, because lust will kill you. Lust will steal. Lust will steal the spiritual manhood of producing sons. And you'll fall back and you'll satisfy yourself with building the church. Because look at I got seven to one. And Isaiah prophesied the same thing. There'll be seven women for one man. Oh, there's some good traits to that. But the father didn't say that. He said, I'm going to build sons and daughters in my image and likeness. What is the blessing of inheritance? I'm glad you asked. Let me read this one. Oh, 1 Corinthians 4, Josh. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, right in the lower thirds, if they can get it. For thou hast 10,000 instructors, boy leaders, in Christ, yet have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now in Hebrew it would read, For thou hast 10,000 instructor boy leaders in Mashiach. You have yet not many huh, Mashiachs. For in Mashiach I have begotten you through the Torah. Through the Torah. I hear it. In the name of Yeshua. Hallelujah. You'll be fine. Hallelujah. My, my, my. What is the blessing of inheritance? I'm glad you wanted to ask. The great blessing of inheritance is that a son receives inheritance without personal cost or effort. What was gained from the depths of struggle and commitment to follow the voice of Yahuwah is freely given to a son. When you connect to a father in ministry, you begin to <laughs> recover the generational blessing. When you connect to a spiritual father, you begin to reconnect and receive a spiritual blessing. Inheritance comes. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We <coughs> excuse me. We preach unto you the, the gospel, the Torah of Yahuwah. We are witnesses. And Yahuwah also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe in Torah. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. That we would walk worthy of Torah. Come on. Who has called you unto his kingdom and kabod or glory the King James. But glory really doesn't define it. It's esteem. Kabod, the weight of esteem, and you can feel it when you're ministering. Yeah. The truth. It's you true. can feel it. It's true. What is the double blessing? The double blessing is the inheritance of our Father added to what Yahuwah has already given you as a ministry. Our fathers pass a foundation upon which we can be built on. A father builds on the last man's foundation that was built upon you. Some of you will come to, come to know me. And what's interesting, I may be a father to you because you're entering into ministry. Yeah. If you don't remember, uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Paul the Apostle speaks to his son, Timothy. And he says to him, you know what, Timothy, you're going to have to do things that I'm asking you to do because Paul knew it. Watch this. Watch like, okay, watch. For instance, this is Old Covenant. And I am the Yahuwah of, and then he says, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, four generations. Watch. Therefore, uh, chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Therefore, my son, be strong in, in the favor that is in Christ Jesus or that is in Yeshua Mashiach and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit that 
thou commit those things to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Okay? Paul the Apostle tells Timothy the Son, Timothy the Son speaks to faithful men and faithful men speak to others. How many generations? Four. Four. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and others. Mm -hmm. If we're following the pattern, this is why all those four are so powerfully to the horns of the altar. Come on. Four is the number of qualification. At four horns on the altar, at the brazing altar, when you come right past the gate, the first encounter, the gate, you'll see angelic. Why, why the angels there? Because now you're entering into your born from above encounter and you're going to start seeing heavenly things. Why did Paul say, set your affections on things above? Because he was speaking to, to a generational son. A generational son. Let me finish off now. The preparation of a set ministry. What is necessary in the process of passing on inheritance? Preparation is necessary for the process of effectively passing on inheritance. This means we must be willing to allow Yahuwah to prepare us as skillful fathers to bring forth mature sons. You know why sons leave? Because they didn't have a foundation before they got to you. Mm. And when you start qualifying them and giving them foundational principles of the scripture, they think they know it all because they've heard it in a dream. The father spoke to them in a dream. Job, once, twice, three times. But by speaking to him in a dream did not validate him to walk away and do his thing. Do you know why you get dreams? Because you're asleep. Visions come when you're awake. So some of you are having visions and having dreams, but you're still not under the umbrella or under the, a spot, the spout where the glory comes out and the Father says to you, well done. Today thou art appointed to be a son. Now go. At the appointed time of the Father, who the Son was under governors and tutors, but at that appointed time, he, he appeared to the Son and said, you're ready, now go. And the Son came. And out of nowhere, he turns up and turns <laughs> to face John the Immerser. He turned 30 and then he went and, and, and he, he got a hold of John and John got a hold of him. And they had church at the Jordan. Hallelujah. That's why it's so important to have a spiritual father that can pass on his foundational principles to you. And if you pay attention to listen, all it does is reinforce the foundation that you had before you met that father or that mentor or that coach or that apostle, Sheliak. Let me finish the thought. This means we must be willing to allow Yahuwah to prepare us as skillful fathers to bring forth mature sons. Just as growth cannot come without change, likewise we cannot have order without <coughs> preparation. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Father, I thank you this evening. I thank you for our terabyte. I thank you that we are learning how to become a true sons in this hour. There's so many of us sharing vision, sharing this and sharing that, and it all comes from the word. But we got to go back to the pattern. We got to go back to the first things first, the mention of first things, his name. We're going to rule and reign in his kingdom. We've got to restore his name. Then we've got to come right behind that and start teaching the tabernacle of Moses, types and shadows, so that you can see yourself in the tabernacle as you're walking through so that Timothy says you're a, a man fully furnished. You're a man fully furnished. What do you mean? Well, you're a temple man. You're a temple keeper. Yeah, that's powerful. If you can see what I just said, you're a temple keeper. You keep your temple and therefore you become generational and you'll never, ever come behind in any good thing. Until we see each other again, be barut. I'm thankful that you are here, that you came on, that you watch, that you tell a friend. And some of you that may watch it different than, than you know, when it's aired, 
Tell a friend, go back over it again, hit the subscribe, hit the share, hit the like. And just know that we're here to help promote your ministry. That's what the fivefold's for. The fivefold is to mature you so you can walk through the tabernacle. Type in shadow because the Father wants you to become the tabernacle. Till we see each other again, shalom.